Hi, everyone. Welcome to this latest Group Journalism Network webinar. We're very pleased you can join us today for a discussion on human impacts and human rights on the high seas. We're very pleased to have an outstanding a group of panelists joining us this morning. I'm going to introduce them in just a moment, but first I'll briefly introduce the Earth Journalism Network for those of you not familiar with us. We are a project of Internews, the global media development nonprofit. We're also a global community of now over 15,000 journalists who are dedicated to improving coverage of climate change, the environment, and the ocean. Uh, we offer all kinds of opportunities for working journalists. Uh, if any of you are out there who are interested, for instance, in covering the COP15 Biodiversity Summit taking place in Montreal this December, uh, there's now an open opportunity for you to apply uh, to get a fellowship to, to travel and, and travel there and cover it. Uh, do check out our website at www.earthjournalism.net. You can find all the open opportunities there, as well as lots of information on the stories we've been supporting and the projects we're carrying out. There's, uh, there's and a lot of resources for you, for instance, to uh, uh, resources to help you cover the ocean and the high seas, which is what we're going to be talking about today. This is a, a really important issue. Um, this is the second webinar in a series uh, about the high seas. Um, uh, if you're not familiar with some of the numbers, the high seas, these are areas beyond national jurisdiction. Uh, they cover about half the surface area of our planet and 70% of the ocean by volume. So it's really the Earth's biggest biosphere. And we know, we don't know very much about it, to be honest. Uh, and there's almost no management really of the high seas. So. It's uh, it's become uh, an important issue for journalists to cover, and we hope uh, and we hope you can you can do more coverage about it uh, following today's session. So let me, without further ado, please introduce our, our panelists. We're very grateful for joining us today. First up, we will have Robert Blasiak. He is a researcher at the Stockholm Resilience Center on Sustainable Management of Ocean Resources and Ocean Stewardship. Then we will have Sean Owen, the director of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, who will be speaking on deep sea mining, a really important issue that's going to take uh, center stage, I'm sure, in the years to come. And Ian Urbina, an uh, ocean journalist and director of the nonprofit journalism uh, coalition based in DC called the Outlaw Ocean Project. So I encourage you to look them up more online to get more background. They've all done excellent work in the past. Um, they're each going to speak for about 10 to 12 minutes. Uh, and, and then we'll have a question and answer session. So we certainly encourage you to ask questions. You can do so by clicking on the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Please put your questions in that Q&A feature. There is also a chat, but we won't be monitoring that for questions. Um, you can introduce yourself in the chat or, or we'll use that for other discussion. But if you have questions, please do put that in the Q&A feature. Uh, so we will kick things off now. I will turn it over to Robert to start talking about genetic resources. Robert, do you want to take it away, please? Thanks so much, James. And uh, such a pleasure to be here with all of you today. And thank you to the organizers for making this all possible. So marine genetic resources, why should you care about them? What are they? Well, I have about 10 to 12 minutes, as James said, to make you care about them and make you feel they really are important. And I believe they are. But let me start off with something we all know and love, food. This is food that's traditionally eaten in Korea, jyotgal. It's a fermented seafood dish. And this has been made for over 2,000 years in Korea. And just recently, 20 years ago, uh, a new bacteria was found as one of the fermenting agents in this food, Bacillus geotgali. It was named after the food. Well, why is this interesting? Well, after it was discovered in 2001, we've been able to explore more and more of the world at a genetic level. And since then, it's been found in, this is just a few of the examples, in a mangrove swamp in China, in a sample from a 3,000-year-old mummy in Egypt, 
and also in a deep sea hydrothermal vent in the Pacific Ocean. But why does it matter that we're finding these, this microbial life all around the world? Well, it's of great interest for development of new types of biotechnology. And here's one, one example of it. So this is a patent that was granted in 2020, so two years ago, associated with that bacteria, Bacillus geotgali, which is being used for a new type of bioremediation. So a way of removing inorganic phosphorus from highly polluted river bodies. Uh, so this is a, a way to commercialize this genetic resource, but also to use it for this, uh, this bioremediation process. But this is just one of many different types of applications of marine biotechnology. So pharmaceuticals are another one that's mentioned a lot. Um, over the past 10 years, uh, the annual sales of marine drugs, just the ones with marine origin, are over USD $1 billion in sales annually. Um, they're also used for producing enzymes to synthesize biofuels and for DNA amplification, for cosmetics, for antifoulins, for adhesives, if you want to stick stuff together underwater, for antibiotics, antivirals. You may remember early in the COVID pandemic that there was a big focus on remdesivir, which was one of the first antivirals approved for treatment that also had an origin from the ocean. From bioremediation, as I mentioned earlier, and a cure for male pattern baldness. All right, I made that last one up. That one's not true, but the rest of them really are. Uh, and maybe someday this will be true too. Sorry, guys. Um, but maybe you can also study things like this. The green fluorescent protein was identified in this jellyfish, Echoria victoria. And it was used for all sorts of applications in biomedical uses. And it even resulted in a Nobel Prize for the group that discovered it in 2008. So study marine genetic resources, win a Nobel Prize. Why not? Uh, but what exactly are these? I'm using this term a lot, but it's not a term that really rolls off the tongue. What exactly are marine genetic resources? Well, we do have some definitions. The conventional biological diversity defines genetic resources as genetic material of actual or potential value. But what's genetic material? Well, it's any material, plant, animal, microbial, or other origin containing functional units of heredity, such as individual genes or genetic sequences. Sometimes definitions help, sometimes they don't so much. Basically, it's genetic material that does have some interesting use that we can put it towards, and marine genetic resources, probably from the ocean space. But then if we look at the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, which is widely considered something like a constitution for the ocean, what do you do if you search for marine genetic resources? You don't find anything. It's not mentioned once. Genetic resources are also not in there. Biodiversity isn't even in there. There are a lot of things that are missing from UNCLOS, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. But you do find them if you go back to the conventional biological diversity where the Nagoya Protocol was adopted in 2010. And the main point of the Nagoya Protocol was to shut down some of these really egregious examples of biopiracy, where you would have, for instance, pharmaceutical companies coming to the Amazon and engaging with traditional users of medicinal plants and things like this, and gaining that traditional knowledge, collecting those samples, and then commercializing them back in their countries without any sharing of benefits. So Nagoya Protocol was set out to eliminate that sort of thing from happening. And it requires that there's prior informed consent and mutually agreed terms between that pharmaceutical company's country and the holder of that biological diversity and traditional knowledge. But can you find the governance gap? Well, if you look at this map of the earth, all that white stuff, that's the land. That's where the Nagoya Protocol applies. And also the dark blue part, that's also within national jurisdictions. It also applies there. So if you want to collect samples there, you need to engage with the country before you do it. But if you look at all that light blue, those are areas beyond national jurisdiction, about two thirds of the ocean. And there, there's no regulation on accessing or sharing benefits from use of marine genetic resources. If you have a boat, you can go out there today and collect some and do something interesting with it. You don't have to tell anyone. You don't have to share any benefits, even though this is considered some type of international commons. And why does it matter? Well, there's a lot out there. It's almost half the Earth's surface, right? And there's a lot down there, too. Uh, ecosystems like hydrothermal vents, which were only discovered 50 years ago, where there's all sorts of really unique endemic life that's of great interest. 
And the UN is now negotiating an international treaty to try to close that gap. It's another acronym, BBNJ, Biodiversity in Areas Beyond National Jurisdiction. And one of the four elements of this treaty, you only have to look at the first one here, is marine genetic resources, including questions on benefit sharing. And these discussions, they've been going on forever. They started almost 20 years ago in 2005 through an ad hoc working group, through a preparatory committee, 2016, 2017, and the last four years in an intergovernmental conference. And just to kind of wrap your head around how slowly the UN works, I this is really silly, but I like to put in a photo of Justin Bieber. This was him back in 2005. Here he is today. This is the UN speed of doing things. So just keep that in mind. I mean, what's he going to look like by the time we actually get this treaty? And some international regulations on genetic resources from areas beyond national jurisdiction. But why are marine genetic resources the toughest part of these negotiations? Well, I would point my finger at these two papers, which I like a lot, that were published around 13 years ago uh, from the same research group. And one of the key findings from this one from 2010, that 10 countries account for 90% of patent claims associated with marine genes, including some from international waters. 10 countries, 90%, it doesn't seem like it ticks the boxes of equity and inclusivity that we would hope from the ocean economy. Um, but a lot is changing. I mean, when you think about the trends of ocean use, a lot of times it's these kind of hockey stick curves where things are growing exponentially like aquaculture or shipping. So we had some questions. Well, what, which countries are these? And what's happening in areas beyond national jurisdiction? What's happened over the last decade? And so what did we do? So it wasn't just me, it was we. This is a research group that worked on those answering those questions, specifically what marine genes are showing up in patents, how many patents are actually out there, and who's filing them, and where are they located? And this is what we found. This is an update on those two papers, trying to even use that same methodology that they used uh, back 13 years ago. Uh, we found that there are almost 900 species that are uh, showing up in patents and around 13,000 genetic sequences from those species being referenced in the patent filings. Uh, if we look at where the entities are located uh, that are filing these claims, we find something called a keystone pattern where you have a couple of uh, actors that are really disproportionately sharing, well, taking most of the pie, and then the, the rest, it's a really long tail. So, and 165 countries aren't even on there. They haven't filed any patents related to marine genetic resources. If you add it all up, this is why it matters. You find the top three countries account for 70% of the patent filings. If you look at the top 10 countries, remember what I showed you from the, from the earlier slide, back in 2010, they accounted for 90% of patent filings. With our study, we found it was 98%. So it's actually become even more consolidated among these 10 countries. So this raises a lot of questions. So we like to think of marine biotechnology as a future industry, maybe something that can be more inclusive, that can do things better and more sustainably than what we've done in the past. So can it be part of this idea of a blue economy? But well, if it's going to be that, it needs to be equitable. It can't just be profitable. It also needs to include more countries, not just those 10. How can the rest of the world get involved here? And what are the barriers? And are they falling or are they rising? So there are a couple of um, pictures I'm going to show that uh, give some indication of this. This is just showing basically the research fleet capacity around the world. The top map and bar chart, this is uh, basically the number of research vessels that are owned by different countries. And the bottom chart, it's basically the big research vessels, ones that are capable of going out into the high seas. Wherever you see a dark color, that means they've got a lot of them. Wherever you don't see, that's the countries that aren't able to uh, have their own research vessels going out to do this research. So this is the sort of thing we really need to be pushing against. Um, you see something quite similar here with the publishing and citation of marine science. So this is a, a skewed map of the world that shows the countries that are publishing the most peer-reviewed science on ocean uh, issues and marine science. Uh, you see, again, Europe and North America, China, Japan, Australia are really blown up and the rest of the world shrunken into little bits. Um, but at the same time, it doesn't have to be that way. Some things are moving kind of in, our, in the right direction. So this is an example of the cost of sequencing a base pair of DNA. 
So in 2001, it cost about $6,000 to sequence one base pair of DNA. Over the past 20 years, it's fallen by six orders of magnitude. So now it costs about one cent to sequence one base pair of DNA. So this is something that's opening up a lot of opportunities for, for moving faster in this space. And it's led also to this graph on the right, which is an exponential growth in the size of databases of genetic sequence information, which is now the basis for a lot of the biotechnology work that's being done today. Um, this is my final slide. I just wanted to think a little bit. I, I, do, I know you can't really put your shoes in yourself in other people's shoes, but I was thinking, well, what are the stories around this in marine genetic resources? And I was thinking, well, are BB&J and marine genetic resources on the radar in the country where you're reporting from? How can marine biotechnology be a part of a blue economy for everyone, not just for those three countries or those 10? And if 154 countries, ah, this is the same point again, they have a coastline, right? They have access directly to the ocean. And even those that are landlocked, they also are part of this equation of the international commons. So how can they also participate in these activities? And how can their voice be heard in these BBNJ negotiations? And finally, you have basically all the right language in place for in the sustainable development goals and the agenda 2030 and the UN Decade of Ocean Science for Sustainable Development, which started last year. Uh, they're both calling for a heavy focus on capacity building, access to affordable technology, inclusivity, equity. What does that all look like for marine biotechnology? How can we do it better? All right, that's it. And uh, really looking forward to the other presentations and discussion. Thank you, Robert. It's very interesting. Um, uh, please remember, if you have questions for Robert, you can click on the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. For now, we're going to turn it over to Sean Owen to talk about deep sea mining. Sean, take it away. Great. Thank you, James. And hi, everyone. Uh, I will share my screen. And hope that that's visible. Yes. Great. Well, thank you so much for the opportunity to share with you all today. And it's really nice to follow Robert, who took us deep into the ocean for most of his presentation. Um, I will be speaking to you today about deep sea mining and how it's not worth the risk, at least in our opinion. And when I say our opinion, I'm speaking today on behalf of the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition, which is 100 member organizations worldwide, civil society, non-government organizations, from the very local in, in many small island developing states right to the, some of the bigger, more global organizations. So deep sea mining, we say it isn't worth the risk. Um, and there are three main sort of main, main points that I'm gonna walk you through today. One is that a healthy deep sea is critical for all of us and for all life on earth. Secondly, is that deep sea mining is contrary to what uh, the story that some like to peddle today, it's not actually needed. Um, and, and especially given the risk that it poses to ocean health. And thirdly, I'd like to share with you some of the momentum that is going around, uh, the momentum that is building for a, a pause or a moratorium on deep sea mining. I have to apologize, I have no pictures of Justin Bieber in my presentation, but I will take you on a whirlwind tour through this topic. So firstly, why is deep sea mining, why, why does a healthy deep ocean matter? Um, as Robert shared, it's the largest habitat on Earth. So the deep ocean is actually over 90% of the biosphere on our planet. It's where 90% or more life lives. And it's home to approximately 10 million species, although every time a new uh, research expedition goes down, they come up with a few more. So we, there is still so much more to know. A healthy deep ocean makes life on Earth possible. Um, and it is, as Robert has explained eloquently, a source of future medicines, technology, and all sorts of potential products and benefits that we have yet to discover. And finally, it holds a really important cultural and intrinsic value for people around the world. I want to share with you a quote from, from Debbie Ngawera Packer, a Maori leader in New Zealand. The seabed is our mother earth, and if she is disrupted, so too is the ocean, and as are we. And the ocean as, a, as an origin story, as a source of life on earth is deeply embedded in many cultures around the world and really important. So what is deep sea mining? Um, fundamentally, it is a vessel at the surface 
that sends down large equipment and risers to somehow extract minerals from the bottom of the seabed. It has not yet started. So this is all this is all in development. It's all technology that is currently being worked on and, and, and explored, um, but not yet in application, which is really exciting in the conservation community because it is rare that we get had the chance to stop a hugely destructive activity from happening before it's begun. So in this um, picture, you'll see the three types of seabed mining that are envisaged. On the left-hand side are seafloor massive sulfides, which are effectively targeting hydrothermal vents, which is one of the photos that Robert showed. Um, really exciting, highly, highly uh, complex systems, and probably the last one that would be mined if mining ever did go ahead. On the right-hand side, you see cobalt-rich crusts, which is effectively seamounts or underwater mountains in the sea. There's some exploration being done on this um, by Japan, for example, in, in national waters. But in the middle are the polymetallic, polymetallic nodules, which are found on the deep abyssal plains at depths of about four to six and a half kilometers below the surface of the water. This is where the primary interest currently is, and, and especially in the Pacific, in the, West, the Eastern Pacific Ocean, an area called the clarion Clipperton Zone. So it's these nodules that would-be miners are looking first and foremost to exploit from the deep seabed at the moment. Um, and I will talk a little bit about what that could mean. But first, these are the machines that they're proposing to send down there. So when you hear people who want to mine the seabed using words like harvest, um, they, these are the harvesters, and you can see that they're going to do something far from harvesting. They're going to strip mine um, the seabed and everything around it. So the UK uh, House of Commons Environment Audit Committee was one of, is one of the many groups and bodies that in recent years has been looking into this and has suggested that the case has not yet been made um, for the level of catastrophic impacts that could be realized by mining the deep seabed. Why do we, why do we at this point think it's not worth the risk? Science has found among other things that there would be an irreversible loss of ecosystem services, habitats and species should this strip mining take place, that there would be massive sediment plumes, not just at the seabed at the site of mining, but plumes also as the wastewater was released from the surface of the ship as it processed what was brought up back into the water column, which could then be carried by the currents tens, if not hundreds or thousands of kilometers from the site of mining. There is wastewater and, and potential toxic plume issues, there are issues of noise and light pollution in parts of the planet that have neither noise, much noise or much light, and certainly not of the 24 seven variety that would take place if mining began. There are risks obviously to some of the world's largest carbon sinks in terms of carbon sequestration as we grapple with climate change today. And over 15 years, a single license area would impact the size, an area the size of Costa Rica. There are 31 licenses that have been granted so far uh, in the high seas, and each of these is for a 30 year period with the possibility of extension. So if permitted mining, sea deep seabed mining would be the largest mining operation ever realized on this planet in one of our planet's last remaining wildernesses. Not only is it not wanted though, what we're saying is it is not needed. And what you see here is a small selection of headlines from recent technological developments. Technology is moving quickly and it's moving in, in many places away from the use of metals for batteries. So the pitch to, to mine the deep sea bed is really that we need this for our connectivity and our mobility and our energy uh, for the 21st century. And our answer is actually technology is developing faster than that, and there are alternatives. Additionally, we're saying that deep seabed mining is not needed because we need much more investment in, and we see the movement of circular economy, um, which is then going to reduce the demand for virgin minerals as we get better at redesigning, at reusing, at recycling minerals that have already been brought up, and just better at, 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 at the circular approach to our systems. Finally, there has been no case made that mining the deep sea would actually replace terrestrial mining. So for anyone who points to pictures of, of ter terrible mining practices in different parts of the world today, the answer to that is improve terrestrial mining practices, not go out and open a whole new frontier in, in the deep ocean. 
A final set of concerns around deep sea mining are governance concerns. And the picture you see here is the International Seabed Authority, which is a UN affiliated agency headquartered in Kingston, Jamaica. It was set up under the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea that Robert referred to about 30 years ago. And ever since it has been negotiating a set of regulations to open the deep seabed for mining. The International Seabed, as Robert noted, is the common heritage of mankind. That means that it belongs to all of us and we're effectively stewards of it for future generations as well. And those concepts are not necessarily being brought into the negotiations around how we're gonna open up this space um, as quickly as possible. There's now a two year rule that has been triggered that the agency is racing towards. So as of the end of June next year, 2023, at the moment, the push is on to accelerate the adoption of a regulatory framework to mine the deep seabed. But there are huge issues with this process and with this body, including issues of transparency, voting structures, there's no scientific or environment committee involved. So there's a lot of concern. And I would point you to, if you haven't read it yet, the New York Times came out with a fantastic article just last week called Secret Data, Tiny Islands and a Quest for Treasure on the Ocean Floor. Um, and that article points to a number of, of the concerns and questions being raised. So the good news is resistance is building. So among other things, we have over 600 marine science and policy experts uh, from around the world who have signed a, a statement calling for a precautionary pause on deep sea mining. We have a growing number of companies who are also calling on governments to support a global moratorium on deep sea bed mining. And effectively these companies and a number of others uh, not on my screen are effectively pre-divesting themselves from the use of metals. Should they ever come out of the deep sea bed, they are saying we will not be using them because they do not meet our sustainability vision or standards. We have a growing group in the fisheries sector around the world who are calling for a moratorium on deep seabed mining, also uh, of the opinion that this would not be good for fisheries worldwide. We're also seeing from various high level panels from the uh, UN Environment Program Finance Initiative just recently published a, an updated guidance on the principles of a sustainable blue economy. And they have stated unequivocally that like oil and gas, Deep seabed mining is also not considered part of a sustainable full blue economy full stop. So this is important to those two governments that are making commitments toward these principles. Here what you see is a, is, is a reflection now of government um, commitment or government growing government concern uh, and support for a moratorium. This is a picture from the International Union for Conservation of Nature, IUCN World Conservation Congress in Marseille last year in September. In blue, you see the government votes for a motion calling for a moratorium on deep sea mining. And in yellow, you see the civil society votes. So an overwhelming yes vote uh, calling for a moratorium on deep sea bed mining. That political momentum has carried through into this year. Um, and in June in Lisbon at the, at the UN conference, uh, Ocean Conference, there was Fiji and Palau launched a, a global alliance of countries calling for a moratorium on their own call for a moratorium. And what you see on the right is that that group of parliamentarians, that call has now 228 signatures from parliamentarians across the world. Um, so political momentum, civil society momentum, faith-based institutions, and Sir David Attenborough himself are all coming out saying, we are not ready, the world is not ready, this is not worth the risk. So, like Robert, I sort of asked myself the question, how can journalists connect with this topic? Um, I loved Robert's selection of, of potential titles or potential stories that you could go to. I took more the approach of who could you speak to? Who could you reach out to? So the Deep Sea Conservation Coalition membership, as I mentioned, is 100 organizations around the world. Um, and we are all available to, to speak to on this topic. Um, as I mentioned, there are the calls for moratorium by the groups of scientists, by companies, by governments and parliamentarians, faith-based organizations and celebrities. And additionally, there are 167 member countries at the International Seabed Authority. So 
most of you should be able to reach out to your governments and say, what's going on? What is your position on this and why? Resistance is powerful and it's building in many places. And here is our website um, and my Twitter account, which is fairly active on this topic, um, and my email address. Please reach out to me directly if you want to. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean. And thanks to those of you who are sending in your questions to the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We'll get to those in, in, in just a moment, but first we're gonna turn it over to Ian Urbina from the Outlaw Ocean Project. Ian, take it away. Thank you. Um, first of all, um, I think I'll just uh, try to talk about uh, who we are, uh, the Outlaw Ocean Project and what we do. Um, and the backdrop of that discussion uh, will be to make a larger point about um, that pivots a bit um, from a focus on uh, news stories uh, that um, are below the waterline and perhaps um, move into a discussion of the additional uh, stories that you might find above the waterline and that focus less on marine um, concerns and more on the human um, issues and the characters there. Um, so that's my agenda. Um, so to step back, uh, I'm a journalist and um, I'm based in Washington, D.C. and spent most of my career, about 17 years, on the investigative team uh, at the New York Times and um, then stepped away from the New York Times and created a sort of ProPublica style uh, nonprofit journalism organization. Um, we are a journalism organization, not an advocacy organization, and we focus on the watery two thirds of the planet. Um, and we do a couple of things distinctly. Uh, we are a staff of 10, um, all delocated, and we um, sort of focus on um, stories that we try to keep um, uh, at the intersection of um, environmental and human um, uh, stories at sea. So um, human rights, labor, and environmental crimes, where they intersect and why they are important to um, report on. We also try to report all of our stories uh, with at least some of the reporting at sea. Um, uh, we just think it provides a sort of vicarious credibility uh, to be able to um, render to the public um, uh, directly and firsthand. And obviously the video potential is much greater when you're on site. Um, and then lastly, we um, try to distribute uh, the content in a very different way, um, uh, um, which I can go into during Q&A. Um, one of the challenges I see journalistically, and I'm assuming that most people attending here today are, are ocean journalists um, uh, are, or journalists in general that might be interested in, the, in this realm. Uh, one of the challenges I found uh, uh, at the New York Times, which was, a, um, I have nothing but positive things to say about uh, the sort of teaching hospital that is that uh, newspaper, um, is that there's a silo um, uh, uh, issue in not just within journalism and how beats are defined, um, and topics are carved up. Um, but that same um, fundamental uh, epistemological, if you will, um, problem then moves from journalism into the realm of policy. And so um, when you look at the ocean space as a journalist and you think of it as an environmental story exclusively, um, you overlook a lot of potential interest, um, a huge portion of the reading and consuming public uh, and real narrative potential, but you also create a narrative and explanatory um, uh, uh, output, if you will, that then plays into phenomena that we saw time that I saw time and again, where you know you have government um, uh, advocates, um, others thinking of this space. You know, so NOAA, for example, doesn't talk to Department of State. You know, you you take a topic like sea slavery and you write a story that's meant to stay at the intersection and explain why overfishing globally has driven the rise of sea slavery and the, the interplay of environmental degradation, food security concerns with human trafficking concerns and Western consumption habits, right? And you write a story that's very much staying in conversation between those issues. Uh, the minute it goes out, you then also have to confront the way that government and um, lawyers, lawmakers, advocates, uh, academics, et cetera, are all divided up into silos. Uh, and 
um, they prefer to stay within their silo. And so um, you have a challenge in trying to figure out how policy outcomes that fix some of these things that you've highlighted might actually get the various players to talk more to each other. Um, so that's one of the things that I think is really important for us as journalists to keep an eye on uh, in how we craft the reporting and how we put out the story, but also what comes next. If your goal is outcomes, then you do follow up on your own reporting and uh, you try to do subsequent stories and you try to keep the momentum going, ideally to solve some of the things that you're highlighting. And uh, one of the big challenges I think you'll uh, encounter time and again uh, in this space and others is uh, the silo problem. Um, I would also just sort of say that, uh, um, again, we have the luxury at my um, organization and, um, of sticking with a single story or subject for a year, sometimes two years, um, uh, and then putting it out into the public. Most um, working journalists don't have that luxury um, of that time, amount of time to go deep on things. Um, it is a real luxury, but I would say wherever you can um, engage in the crime of slow journalism, do so. You know, uh, really, really uh, resist the pressure of the internet news cycle that attempts to get you to speed up and churn something out. Uh, and uh, invariably results in weaker journalism. Um, the, the other thing I would say is that, again, this is my own opinion and, and, and many people disagree uh, in, in journalism, but um, one of the things having done this for 35 years, it's I, I do now really believe what editors so often told me, which was um, don't write articles, write stories. Um, the way that in my you know armchair psychologist, um, perspective um, believes that the way that most people, average people think is that they organize information in their own head, often in narrative fashion. So there's a story arc, there's a character and they understand things um, in that way. And if you as a journalist are thinking about how you can put forward, it could be an explanatory, it can be investigative, it can be beat reporting, but it should always, in my personal view, aspire to be narrative in its delivery. So you explain um, what's happening on the high seas and, the, and what's at stake in, in the degradation of, of biodiversity. You explain who the culprits are. All these things can happen, but ideally you do so, you deliver it in a, in a narrative form that tells a story because average people, I personally think, and I was a former academic before I became a journalist, so this is not besmirching um, the academy, but average people do not think first in an explanatory, let to explain, answer a question for me. They want and they think of a story. And if you answer questions along the way in your story, you get the job done, but you keep their attention, make them feel things more passionately if you can find a way to do that. And I don't, anyway, so I, I would just sort of, to the extent that I'm lecturing, um, I think those are real high priorities that we try to craft into how we tackle stories. When it comes to the ocean space specifically, and I'm watching the clock because I'm going to stop at 10 sharp, um, uh, I would say don't forget that 50 million people work out there, over 50 million people. It is a massive, massive workplace. And the diversity of characters out there, again, not all of them stay out there. Not all of them are on the high seas. Uh, some of them are day, you know, near shore fishermen. Um, but a massive number of people are working out there and a huge, huge portion of them quite especially, and if you look at shipping, it's two million, uh, fishing is the bulk of the rest of them, and a huge portion of the fishing workforce are on the high seas, and many of them are from developing poor nations, and many of those are trafficked, and they are unusually voiceless. These are typically transient, often trafficked, uh, often from countries that are not even native to the flag, the captain, or the cargo of the ship, um, so if you're very interested in human stories, period, it's a extremely attractive frontier um, to explore journalistically. And secondly, I would say if you're very interested in fascinating characters and virgin snow journalistically, topically, um, it is uh, it, there are a few beats better in, in my view. Um, think of, again, in the last... 40 months, we've covered stories of repo men who hire, who are hired by banks to shield ships, murder of stowaways, arms trafficking, sea slavery, overfishing, illegal whaling, intentional dumping of oil through magic pipes, 
rape on cruise ships, seabed mining, um, uh, arms trafficking, I think I may have said that, um, uh, 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 libertarians who create micro nations for better and for worse, but quixotic motivations around the world and their fate, abortion providing on the high seas. Um, again, these are not marine and environmental issues, sure. Um, many of them can and are, certainly the fishing realm um, issue and the dumping are, but there are amazing human stories to be told out there. Um, and then in my view, some of the most important and fascinating, if you do it right, stories are the ones that are less um, attention grabbing. So they're the chronic, not the acute crimes. By that, I mean abandonment of seafarer, wage theft, um, these uh, low grade uh, physical violence, debt bondage. These are not dramatic murder rape type crimes, but they're uh, unbelievably common, often with impunity crimes that are pervasive in this realm. and affect people's lives, you know, uh, in a deeply consequential way. So there's really great stories and reporting to be done in this realm on the high seas that right now there's very little um, solid coverage occurring. Um, uh, so that would be my plea to you. Thank you, Ian. So very rich territory out there, both. You're muted. Sorry, can you, can you guys hear me now? Yeah. So very rich territory out there, both literally and in terms of storytelling. Now we're going to turn to some questions. Thank you for those questions that have come in. Try to get to as many as we can. I'm mindful that Robert's going to have to leave us a little bit early in about 15 minutes. So my first question to the panelists, do you have any updates on the BBNJ negotiations? I know they've just been around recently at the UN. Uh, any quick snapshots on what are the key sticking points or what, you know, journalists who are interested in the treaty, what they should be following or talking to their own government representatives about if they want to cover the treaty talks? Robert, do you have, oh, Sean, go ahead. I'm happy to start or Robert. Please. Um, so yeah, thanks. It's a good question, James, because as, as, as you noted, we are just out of the fifth intergovernmental conference uh, on, on the negotiations and there had been hope uh, that the negotiations would wrap up, that the ship would be taken to shore. And um, there was some disappointment at the end of the two weeks that that didn't happen. Um, so indeed there will need to be another conference which is, is currently being scheduled. Um, the, the, the negotiations focused on the four areas uh, that Robert mentioned, so marine genetic resources, area-based management tools, including marine protected areas, uh, environmental impact assessments, and capacity building and technology transfer. And so basically, this, it's a real focus on protection of the high seas of ocean biodiversity and equity. Um, and I, I think there was some optimism through the, those two weeks in New York that uh, there was no, no, no countries were acting unreasonably. It felt like everyone was acting in good faith. It's just these negotiations are complex. Why was it, why, why did it fail? And I use quotation marks there because I don't think it did fail. I think, I think it was a, a good solid two weeks of negotiations in good faith. And it just, the, the more time was needed. Um, so what to follow? There's still, there's still discussions around, there's sort of still sticking points around the question of equi equity, this north-south divide that Robert spoke to in his presentation remains. How are we gonna share the benefits? How, you know, where are the financial transfers? How big are they? How will they be managed? Also, what are the institutional arrangements of the new, once the treaty is signed, what will ratification and compliance look like? What will implementation look like? This is, this is complex. Um, and so I, I would hope, I don't know if I would say expect, I'd go as far as to say expect, but I would hope that the next round of negotiations will take us to com completion. Robert, I don't know if you had anything to add. No, you covered it really nicely, Sean. Maybe I'd just pick up on one minor point. So I also, from all of my uh, contacts who were in the room for the negotiations, there is optimism, really cautious optimism, but uh, a feeling that they're moving towards the goal. And the big news on marine genetic resources is that for years and years, the kind of highly industrialized countries have been saying, benefit sharing, we don't want to talk to you if you're talking about money. 
non-monetary benefit sharing, no problem. We'll share information about the genetic sequence data. We'll upload it so that it's public, but we're not sharing any monetary benefits. Don't talk about it. But this was the first time where that door opened up a bit. And this is a really, really key thing for all those other countries. They say, yeah, I mean, if the high seas, if it is our common heritage, we want to be involved in this and we want to also share in those benefits. So it seems that there is more convergence now and an important door is open a little bit and hopefully opens a little more at the next meeting. Thank you, Robert and Sean. So we got a bunch of questions and I, I think I'll, I'll share several uh, that uh, I'll combine several for, for each of the panelists. So I'll begin with Sean. We got a bunch of questions for you. Um, have there been life cycle analysis comparing uh, uh, terrestrial mining with deep sea mining and the impacts thereof? Um, what is the two year rule? You, you referenced that in your slides, but I don't know that we discussed it. Um, and any, uh, any progress on the moratorium and where that's going? So thank you. The, the first question on um, life cycle analyses, I was actually just um, typing an answer to that. So I've, I've, I've sent an answer in writing the best I could um, to the question. So my, my, my opening response on that is that we really shouldn't be comparing apples with oranges, which is better land-based mining or deep sea mining. Um, I think what we need to talk about is step back and say, well, how do we meet humanity's future needs, right? How do we meet these mobility, connectivity, energy needs of the future? Um, and so we've got land-based mining, which is one industry that is already existing, that's already in play, that is already delivering a certain supply of the, of the materials that we need. Um, and, and one key question is, can that be, you know, there's a lot of concern and criticism about the human rights, the, the environmental and social impacts of mining today. But there's a, there are some very good answers to that in terms of improved governance and social and environmental practices, which are not put into place. And that's a governance issue first and foremost. So first of all, land-based mining could be greatly improved. And what we're hearing from local communities, from mining communities is exactly that. Don't take away, don't close the mine. Don't take away our, our livelihood and our jobs. Just improve. We want to work, but we want to work in humane, safe, environmental conditions. So that's one answer. A second answer on the terrestrial front is that we do understand that there are a number of um, sources of terrestrial minerals that are available that have not yet been tapped into for whatever, for price and technology reasons. So this is also an area to be looking at, and, and again, from strict environmental, social and government standards. Looking at the deep ocean, we have no robust uh, life cycle analysis because this has not begun yet. Deep sea mining does not yet exist. So all of the conclusions that we're drawing about the potential impacts are exactly that. They're scenarios and their projections. Um, and one of the reasons for the call for a moratorium is precisely because we know so little about the deep ocean still. You know, a commonly quoted fact is that we know more about the surface of the moon than we do about the deep ocean, and that remains true. Um, so we're calling for, and, and, and Robert's colleagues have put out some excellent papers saying that we need actually several decades of scientific research before we really can make evidence-based decisions about whether mining the deep ocean actually does make sense economically and environmentally. So I'll leave that answer there quickly because you've asked me two more questions. The two-year rule is an arcane, um, an arcane piece of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, um, which left it open for any of the 167 members of the International Seabed Authority, any of the member states, to be able to trigger it. And, and, and once it was triggered, the ISA had two years from moment of triggering to adopt a regulatory framework to mine the deep ocean or my or consideration uh, licensing of exploitation licenses could begin under whatever provisional regulations were there. So last summer at the end of June, the Pacific Island state of Nauru triggered the two year rule, which gave the whole world 24 months until the end of June 2023 to come up with a regulatory framework. And that means environmental management plans. That means finance, uh, financial mechanisms, liability mechanisms, agreements on what the, how, what, how things would be monitored, shared. 
there's a massive amount, um, even after 30 years of negotiation, there are a number of issues that are nowhere near resolution uh, at the ISA. And this, this two, triggering of the two-year rule has put an intense pressure on the process. Um, finally, how is, how is progress going with the calls for a moratorium? So given that we are exactly a year past the adoption of the resolution for a moratorium at the World Conservation Congress last September, um, and looking at all of the calls from the various, um, various segments of society, the companies, the scientists, the civil society groups, and then looking at now the momentum that is building within governments, um, now governments as well as individual parliamentarians stepping forward calling for more term, I would say we were on um, quite a, a rapid track now. It's, it's a discussion that is active in many political spaces at the local, the regional and the global levels. Um, it's, a, it's a very quick moving space. Thanks, Sean. And just one more quick question. Is it, you think uh, it's possible for deep sea mining to be sustainable? No, no. If the damage is, is, is going to be irreversible, that is one piece of science that we do have clearly, whatever damage does occur, because things move so slowly in that ecosystem, um, it, the damage will be irreversible in human time scales. So you are removing whatever you are removing for good. Um, and, and what we don't know is just how far and wide those impacts will go beyond the site of the mining. Thank you, Sean. Uh, we've got a bunch of questions for Ian, but again, I'm mindful, Robert will have to leave us in about four minutes. So I wanna give him a chance for some, any final thoughts you may have. I do have one question for you, Robert. We noticed that Germany has been very zealous in in filing patents on marine, you know, genetic marine genetic resources, uh, what's going on there? Is I mean, I know they're a, a wealthy country with a lot of pharmaceutical business, but um, any insights on that? And then maybe share some final thoughts before you leave. Yeah, thanks, James. I'll keep it really quick because I also want to hear a bit more of Ian before I have to <laughs> jump off. But uh, but Germany, yes, uh, they're the headquarters of BASF the world's largest agrochemical company, and they're the, the main uh, entity there. Um, I say that a little hesitantly because whenever I present on this, I, I think people really like to focus in. It's really easy to just think, ah, giant multinational corporation, they're evil. Point your finger, they're terrible. But I don't think it's that simple. I think the important thing isn't that they stop doing this. It's that more are able to also participate inclusively in this activity. So it's not about shutting them down. Uh, it's about making sure that they, yes, they can continue investing in these in these activities, but that you, other uh, countries and other um, companies, maybe also in some of those other countries that aren't represented now, also have an ability to engage and compete in this area. So th that's my personal standpoint. It's easy to point fingers there, and I, I hesitate, and I feel weird being on the side of a giant company now, but uh, that's, I'll, I'll just end with that and, and pass to Ian. Thanks so much, James. Thank you again, Robert. Um, okay, Ian, a bunch of questions for you. Uh, we have a, a, a question from a Liberian journalist who wants to do a story on hunting on the deep seas, perhaps hunting of sharks. Um, how would she go about trying to cover that in your opinion? What, what advice would you have, be able to give her? Also, do you, have you ever covered stories about fights between trawlers or other kinds of intense conflicts between trawling operations on the high seas. And a kind of more general question that came in, you already addressed this to a certain extent is, why don't we see more media coverage of the high seas? Uh, sure, so, but before Robert goes, I just wanna um, thank both Robert and Sean. These are two people that may not remember, but for the last five years, um, They've been incredible tutors for me, uh, really generous with their time uh, and responding to emails. So sorry, Robert and Sean, I'm you know, gonna encourage everyone else who's attending here, hit these people. Uh, they actually do respond to emails and they know what they're talking about. So they're really good sources, um, not just about seabed mining, but, and they know how to also translate, which is very rare, translate things into plain terms that you can understand and your audience can. Um, Sharks, uh, yeah, um, really good stories on shark finning. Um, uh, a lot of room for peril in reporting shark finning 
you know, um, working on a big investigation on our third year now of a look at the Chinese presence on the water globally. And, um, uh, you know, one piece that we'll be doing is a close look at um, some missteps historically of legacy outlets um, when it comes to reporting about the Chinese and specifically about concerns about sharks. Um, and the, the standard mistake there is um, really, you got to know what sorts of ships squid vet, squid jiggers do not shark fin. You know, um, there there are small, huge missteps that a journalist can make um, where they think that the presence of a certain type of ship um, might imply a risk to a certain type of species, and that's where you really need good tutors to to check those things because certain types of vessels, because of how they fish, are very unlikely to be targeting you know, uh, or inadvertently um, catching certain species and others. So just be careful on that. Um, you know, shark finning is a perfect example of something I love as a topic because it's very intersectional. You know, there is really good evidence that shark, uh, shark targeting of sharks or inadvertent catch and monetizing of shark fins is a human story in the sense that often the very labor on these vessels are paid a below um, uh, livable wage with the either stated in the contract, I've seen them, or unstated um, supplement, uh, whereby the crew is allowed to sell the shark fins on the side when they come back to land to help bolster their wages. So the captain pays them X wage, which is impossibly low, but says you guys can sell as a group the shark fins we catch and bolster your wages. That's a human story, that's a wage story, but also it's a marine story. And that to me is where the best journalism is happening. Um, but there's really good work to be done on shark finning because that, you know, sharks are just being decimated. Uh, and it also gets you into interesting online on land stories about shifting popularity of certain dishes like shark fin soup and sort of how cultural trends and the rise of the middle class in China have changed the taste for shark fin soup. So it's a very good story. I'm happy to talk more, shoot me an email. Um, second question, I'm trying to move fast in respect of time, fights. Yeah, I mean, uh, one of the first stories we did, which was in the New York Times front page, was about a murder that was captured on camera. Um, it was initially dismissed. It was a murder, sort of 10 minute, 26 second slow motion slaughter where you know unknown fellas were using semi-automatic weapons to kill these guys in the water, at least five, most likely 15. It was dismissed by law enforcement at the time as pirates. Uh, we investigated for two years at the Times, and then I did it, you know, did it for the book, and then I went to the Washington Post and did it for them. And seven years later, you know, that um, captain who ordered those killings has, you know, received a 26-year sentence. But that's a seven-year investigation of a murder on camera, and ultimately, what that was was a clash between fishing vessels, um, where a Taiwanese. These are not trawlers; these are Taiwanese tuna longliners in the Indian Ocean. Um, but yes, there's really important stories and a and lot of open source user UGC, user generated content, cell phone footage out there if you really want to look at violence on crew, between crew, between vessels. So ripe target. Why isn't there more coverage at sea? You know, it's, it's expensive, it's time consuming, um, it's dangerous um, to some degree, not in the way you might expect, not not in my view, typically that captains want to do you harm as a reporter, but more just these are dangerous workplaces and and um, you've got to be really careful if you're going to spend time on these vessels. Um, uh, so it's 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 I think one of the most difficult realms to cover uh, if you actually want to get out into the space and do it. And most editors don't have the budget or patience, and most journalists um, uh, don't have their own budget so as to spend that much time on one story. But that's why you see very little coverage of this. Thank you, Ian. A couple more questions for you before we ask each of our remaining panelists to kind of offer their final thoughts. And I do see that there's a lot of information going on in the chat with the links to resources. So do check that out for those of you in the audience. Uh, Ian, there is recently, or, or Sean, you can answer this as well, but. There's recently a treaty passed at the World Trade Organization trying to limit uh, harmful fishery subsidies. Do you think that is going to have an impact on what goes on, especially on the high seas? And a question uh, from the audience, do you think the rise of awareness on IEU fishing from the US and Europe recently can be related to, quote, the commercial war against China? Or do you think some of these actions are being 
are basically trying to target China as, you know, uh, I guess the implication is unfairly. Do you have any thoughts on those questions? I can grab it, but Sean, if you, if you uh, um, yeah, subsidies, I think it's a really, really good topic. It's, it's, it's hard because it's boring um, and you've got to make it interesting to people, but it is like, uh, boring like the air we breathe. It's kind of essential, and it is the air that undergirds the overcapacity of vessels and the overfishing on the world's oceans. And the reason that the oceans are running out of fish is subsidies, huge part. Um, so it's a very important target. Um, and I do think the WTA DTO discussions were important, but the devil is always in the details, and there are really worrisome details in that um, discussion. For example. Uh, and again, not to, I think the, the second person is quite right to be a, journalistically a bit skeptical of various agendas, including a U.S. geopolitical agenda to demonize China. But China is at the same time. Uh, I think China is also the uncontested, you know, uh, seafood superpower in every metric, uh, number of vessels, um, uh, tonnage pulled out of the water, et cetera. Um, uh, consumption, export, import, everything when it comes to seafood, China is the force. And it's also the largest in any metric subsidizer of um, its fleet. Uh, and um, those subsidies are very easily, you know, kind of connected to um, unhealthy competition, uh, increased IUU, and because there isn't enough ground to cover vessels going into national waters where they shouldn't be, going into MPAs where they shouldn't be. So subsidies is, are key. Um, you look at the WTA discussion, WTO discussions, and you see, for example, some worrisome slights of hand. For example, China self-designating as a developing nation um, and getting an exemption from having to apply the prohibitions on subsidies on a certain timetable because it is a air quotes here developing nation. Um, that's problematic. Um, when it comes to seafood and when it comes to most metrics, China is no longer a developing nation. It is the world superpower and so therefore should not be given a separate pacing on when it should fade out subsidies. There are, it's also important, I think, on subsidies to distinguish good from bad. There are most of the subsidies we talk about are the bad subsidies, subsidies that expand capacity, make vessels more efficient, allow them to stay out longer, et cetera. Um, there are the subsidies that actually are helpful are the subsidies that help reduce the fleet, transition fishers out of the industry to other industries. Um, some forms of aquaculture, and a lot to say on aquaculture, are actually very positive, and subsidies that help foster those forms of aquaculture are um, worth looking at. Uh, so just be careful as to which subsidies you're talking about. Thank you, Ian. Uh, I know we've only just tapped the surface of this. I'm going to turn it over to Sean for any last thoughts we well, had? just quickly on the on the subsidies point specifically, yeah. I agree with everything that Ian has said. I do think as well, though, that the progress that has been made at the WTO recently is a reflection of a few important trends. One, you know, one is the years and years of grinding persistence that has been put into this these negotiations, um, and a tribute to those who have stayed at the table and really and really pushed and are starting to get traction in important areas. Um, but also, I think. I think there's a, a, a trend of a, an increasing sense of urgency, right? And, and maybe this is just the optimist in me speaking, but I think the world is waking up, right? This, this, these combined crises of climate and biodiversity loss and human health in the last couple of years is, is giving, is sort of waking everybody up and saying, wait, what are we doing wrong and how can we stop that? And I think there's a real opportunity now um, warts and and flaws with you know with the negotiations notwithstanding i think i think now that we have a real opportunity to push this over the finish line and to really capitalize on some of some of the wins at the world trade organization among others and just the other thing to say is that the the, the movement of youth we're finding in our ocean conservation work the move the youth movement the, the young people are coming in they have that sense of urgency and a sense of anger, and we are not going to put up with this. And that is really helpful toward toward uh, toward making some of the real change that we need to see. Thank you, Sean, and thanks again for joining our panel. Ian, any last thoughts before we wrap up? No, I mean I would just. I, um, I think that. Um, 
again, bearing in mind the audience, uh, number one, um, be mindful of who your audience is and, and really think hard about what portions of the planet are being missed in how your stories get framed or distributed. And the distribution of journalism is a very much overlooked um, bottleneck in, in our profession. And so thinking about, just as Sean was saying, you know, I write for the New Yorker and the New York Times and, and the Washington Post, and my 18-year-old son does not read any of those things. And, um, but he consumes massive amounts of news. And so figuring out where are, you know, the youth getting their information from and how, and, and, how, and not dismissively like I roll Facebook and TikTok and Justin Bieber, don't do that. You know, like think about where are they, respect them, and then go to them and figure out how you can bring what you're doing to them. I think that's really important and, and it really belongs to you guys as journalists. It's not a world in which you can rely on your venue, your, your newspaper, your outlet to do it for you. You've got to go direct to market. Uh, so just think about that as well on any stories you do, I would, I would encourage. Thanks again, Ian. Thank you to our panelists and thanks to all of you in the audience for your, for your attention and for asking such great questions. I think we got to most, if not all of them. Um, I'm sure there's a lot more to be discussed. Uh, we will be uh, sending a recording of this webinar to everyone who registered and we'll post it on the earthjournalism.net website. Please stay tuned for more webinars on lots of ocean and other environmental issues and uh, go out there and we're looking forward to seeing your stories. Thanks again, everybody. I'm going to sign off now. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, James. Thanks, Ian. Bye.